The following is an exclusive presentation of Ravens Productions. What's up, Ravens fans? Welcome into a fresh edition of Ravens Unscripted, coming to you, as always, from the Under Armour Performance Center. We hope you're enjoying a Thanksgiving week, and obviously a lot to be happy about after the Ravens picked up their first win in a month. So a lot to get into. Let me introduce the panel. We've got Garrett Downing, Ryan Mink of Ravens Media, and our favorite, Dennis Pitta, is back with us as well. And guys, let's start with four downs. Well, Garrett, first down, with some time to think about it, what has been in your mind the most, your biggest takeaway from what was a wild game against the Bengals? Well, I'll start with the obvious choice. I think that's Lamar Jackson. I mean, I think you look at this, and there was a lot of excitement about how he would play and what he would do, and I liked what I saw from him. Obviously, it was a totally different offense, totally different game plan with him at quarterback, but it was exciting. And so, to me, that's the biggest takeaway. I mean, if you're standing around a water cooler in Baltimore and doing that kind of cliche discussion right now, everyone's talking about Lamar Jackson at quarterback. And, you know, so I'm sure the Ravens are having conversations right now about what they do and, and when Joe's healthy and all that. But that, to me, is what stood out. You know, what, where do you go from here? We'll see. But I just think that Lamar being at quarterback was a fun thing to watch, and it was my biggest takeaway. To me, it's bigger than just Lamar. I mean, the entire offense changed. I mean, it was like a, a totally different team out there. I mean, you have your quarterback running 27 times. Our, the run game had been pretty bad for the majority of the season now everything is riding on the run game I mean you know it, it makes you wonder was this the dawning of a new era and you're right it was a completely different offense I mean I watched the game and I don't know if I recognized a single play from when I was in that same offense and so you weren't running the run pass option no and and, and I was talking to you guys earlier about it. I don't know if I had a role in, in an offense like that because I wasn't much of a blocker I was more of a receiving tight end but that being said I do think Lamar played well in what they asked him to do. Now, they didn't ask him to really throw the ball. And so that will be the question mark moving forward. Can he develop at least to be an adequate passer? Because you know in this league, you have to be able to throw the ball. What happens when you get down by a score or two and you have to throw your way back into it? You cannot just continue to ground and pound. I mean, Lamar was tremendous. You saw his athleticism and everything he brought to the table. Now, can he develop as a passer? Because I don't think he's there yet. Okay, well, that takes us to second down. and. Lamar's performance, Ryan, I think Dennis covered a lot of it, but what do you feel like the coaches, after they got over the excitement of winning, thought about the way that he played? And to Dennis's point, what they're going to need him to do if he has to play against Oakland yeah. and moving forward. To me, I think that he delivered kind of what you expected, right? I mean, with Lamar, you have to know that there's going to be the good and the bad, and you have to be okay with both of it because he's going to have rookie hiccups like he did with his interception, which was just a bad pick. But on the other hand, Lamar picks up a lot of positive yardage. There's not a lot of zero-yard plays, a lot of incompletions, because as long as he's running, he gets three, four yards. So you're not often fa falling behind and down distance. So. He's going to electrify the offense at times. I think he excited the fans. He excited his teammates at times around him because of the way that he plays. Uh, but So you have, you have to take the good and the bad. So I think the coaches probably came away with it and said, you know what, this is what we're going to get with Lamar. And moving forward, yes, he's going to have to throw the ball a little bit more. But if he can keep running the way that he did yesterday – we think that we can win games and score points that way. My question is how much more he has to throw the ball. 51 rushing attempts for the team yesterday, 19 passes. I think we can all sit here and agree that that's not necessarily a recipe for success week in and week out. I just wonder at what point do you give Lamar more of the passing playbook? I mean, are they going to allow him to throw the ball 30 times? 35. I mean, at what point does it shift in that direction? Because I think that if you're going to go out there and play a really good offense like Atlanta or Kansas City on the road mm -hmm. in a few weeks, and if he's going to be your quarterback in that scenario, you need to score more points, and so you are going to have to put more of the passing. The, the question is whether you do need to score more points because Lamar eats the clock by virtue of running so much. When so you, you play at Kansas City, when you play an L.A. charge, you're going to have to score more points. <laughs> That's just a fact, okay? Uh -huh. And so can you do it just running? three, four yards at a time, an occasional chunk play, I don't think it's sustainable to be able to run an offense like that. Now, I want to give a ton of credit to the coaching staff and what they put Lamar in position to do yesterday because they played to his strengths. Mm -hmm. He was tremendous. He used his athleticism, his legs, to create plays and oftentimes big plays. 
and that worked yesterday. But guess what? That was the 32nd ranked defense they were going against. Yes. A defense that, before the bye week, gave up 244 yards rushing to the Saints. And they saw Lamar for the first time. So you had the, the wrinkle of it being now all Now you new. have tape on a guy like right. Lamar. I mean, these coaches get paid, too, that you're going against, right. and they're good defensive coordinators out there. They're going to find a way to slow down what they did against the Bengals. Now, they may not be able to completely stop it, but they're going to be more effective moving forward than the Bengals were on Sunday. And so you're going to have to develop another element to this offense. Yes. And that's the question mark. I'm not saying he can't do it. I, I'm saying we haven't seen it. They haven't asked him to do it. Yeah. They haven't necessarily trusted him to drop back and do it a lot. And so we'll see if he can handle that. And I, I'm just not sure at this point. I don't like to say this, but great points by Dennis. Yeah, well, <laughs> and, and as you can tell, I think the, uh, the theme of the show is going to center around Lamar and the offense and, and moving forward. But we do need to talk about the defense quickly here, Garrett. They, they seem to get some of their swagger back, especially at the end of the game with the way they held up on that fourth down and three. What do you feel like this performance means for this defense moving forward? Because they're probably going to, as you guys have touched on, need to do even more. Terrell Suggs said that they felt like it was deja vu. And for them to go out there and get the stop, I think was a confidence booster for them because this defense has had trouble in late game situations over the past couple of years. They needed that kind of a play in that moment. And I think that we all look at this defense and say it's a good defense, but they need to close out games. And th yesterday was a big step for them in that direction. I go back to what Eric Weddle has been saying or was saying at the beginning of the season, is this the same old Ravens or not, right? Same old Ravens, right? <laughs> and yes, that's how he did it. I'm telling you, go back and roll the clip. Roll the clip. And, and, and yesterday, uh, yesterday to show that it wasn't the same old Ravens was huge because th this team's been stuck in a rut. They need to not be the same old Ravens to not be that team that lets down late in the fourth quarter. It's I'm huge. I'm still confused by what old Ravens <laughs> it is because sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Uh, fourth down, uh, and everybody gets a crack at this, but quickly, uh, will this team make the playoffs? Look, five and five. There's five other teams, and they, I mean, it's a dogfight here for that sixth spot, probably for the wild card. And the Ravens are right in it. It, it. Look, you have the chance to change your opinion in the next few weeks. Yeah. But as you sit now, Ryan, when do you start? Uh, I, I would probably say under 50-50. I, I think the Colts are playing really good football right now. I, I think that they, uh, they're on a winning streak. Their offense is on fire, and that's going to be the Ravens' toughest competition. I'll say the game that it will hinge on is whether the Ravens can beat the Chargers out there in L.A. because that will give the Ravens a better conference record in the event of a tiebreaker at 9-7. and seven. I think if they're one – they win out at home. If their one road win that gets them to 9-7 is in L.A., I think the Ravens have a good chance of getting in. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with that. It's an uphill climb for sure. Yeah. And um, I don't think winning the division is necessarily attainable. It could happen, but the Steelers are playing so well, and they've got a yeah, couple-game lead at this point. It's, it's going to be there. tough to make up that ground. So you're really looking at that wild card position with those two spots. You mentioned the Colts. Uh, the Titans have been playing well. I know they lost – Big Huge. to the Colts yesterday. <laughs> um, but there's just so many factors that have to play out. It's tough to say yes or no, but this team has a chance, and I think they sure. understand that. There's hope in the building, and so it's all going to be they, they control their own destiny. If they can play well down the stretch and, and string together a few wins here, now you have Oakland coming up at home. I mean, everybody feels good about a game like that. So we'll see how it goes, but it's it's one game at a time. You got Oakland this week, and that's going to be their focus. I think this team probably finishes the season nine and seven, and I think it probably comes down to a tiebreaker. So I'm not going to go through and try to figure all those out, but I do think that it is a tiebreaker scenario, and I think that nine and seven is the most likely final record for this team at the end of the regular season. Well, before we head to break, Gus Edwards had a breakout performance, and here's a view of his first NFL touchdown, 360 style, presented by Triple X. Jackson in the gun. Gives to Gus Edwards. Edwards up the middle. He's to the five. He rumbles in. Touchdown, Ravens. Gus Edwards with his first NFL touchdown. Welcome back to the Unscripted Couch. Time to put a number next to your opinion. It's the rating game. I'll present some topics surrounding this team, and the guys will, with the tablets here put a 1 through 10 usually next to their opinion. So first up, rate Gus Edwards' play against the Bengals, one being anyone could have ran against that team, <laughs> 10, Jamal Lewis, who? <laughs> so the big reveal, oh, we got nines oh. across the board. All right. Dennis, nice. you're our guest, sort of, so go first. <clears throat> 
Okay, I, I was really impressed with Gus Edwards in that game because, yeah, he had a lot of space to run at times, but he broke a lot of tackles, and he was slippery through the hole. He had good vision. I was just really impressed with his running style. He had a low center of gravity, always was finishing runs in a punishing manner, falling forward. And so he's a guy that I think they can continue to rely on. I don't think this was just one game that he kind of broke out. I think he's going to be consistently productive for them moving forward, especially if they continue this style of offense. And one thing, I think he got more carries in this game other than like an Alex Collins or somebody else because he's more familiar with the zone read stuff. And it's tricky, the ball handling with that, being able to know when to take it, when not. He has more experience with that coming out of college in Rutgers than some of these other backs do. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think he's got good feet. And let's not forget, I mean, you, you kind of get lost in, oh, well, he's an undrafted rookie. Who is this guy? I mean, this is a Miami transfer. I mean, this guy's a talented player. Uh, he's got good feet. He's got power. I like the compliment that he gives to Lamar, where Lamar has a little more ankle breaking. Gus is just going to smack you in the mouth. I think my biggest question is who's the lead back moving forward? Because I think I saw that we Lamar saw Jackson. enough. <laughs> yeah, it is Lamar Jackson right now, but I think we saw enough from Gus Edwards to think that he could be getting the lion's share of the carries now over Alex Collins. That's going to be – he's going to be a very popular waiver wire pickup this week in a lot right. of fantasy leagues. And, and I think it depends what style of offense they use moving forward. If it's the same thing we've seen with Lamar, like we saw against the Bengals, I think Gus Edwards is the guy that you feature. All right, coming up next here, it's Chris Moore. Uh, he seems to be a weekly appearance here on the show for some of the plays he made. Rate his one-handed catch in this game, obviously – one being no big deal, 10, it's an all-timer. Whoa! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I beat you, Dennis! Same joke, All right, yeah, there you go. Oh, that <laughs> was crazy. Or is that 1.0? No, that was a comma. Okay. That was a comma. That's 1,000. So that's the best catch I mean, you've ever seen? I mean, that was maybe the catch of the year in the NFL. I mean, honestly, I mean, it wasn't a touchdown catch, but to reach behind you like that with one hand, I mean, it, it was Odell did it over his head. Yeah. Chris just did it behind him. That was a ridiculous. Ridiculous the one thing that's different, though, is that, you know, and I'm not knocking the catch. It was a great catch, but he kind of knocked it into his body and then Did caught he? it. I thought yeah. he kind of stuck it. He didn't really stick it. He kind of it back to himself a little bit. Yes. But it was a great catch. I'm let, just saying a thousand. Let me comment on this because you guys have never caught a football. <laughs> uh, one, whenever he's on the show, he does it once. Yeah, he does the it I played, you didn't thing, <laughs> which we all love. Um, so, speaking from a professional standpoint, <laughs> Professional um, reporter. that's one of the hardest catches in all of football. As you're running a direction and it's low and away, that is so difficult not only to adjust your body and get a hand on it, but to make the catch. And so, just being able to get a hand on it, stick it enough to kind of tip it back to yourself and make the catch was really impressive. One of the best catches I've seen. Now, I'm not going to say it's the best catch I've ever seen, but the difficulty level of a catch like that is really high. Dennis, as a pro, let's keep your answers to 15 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. I bet All Joe right. was wishing his receivers made some catches like that when he was in there. <laughs> Next Not up, that good. back to Lamar. Your confidence level in Lamar with one full game now under his belt. So moving forward, if necessary, 10 being it's his job, couldn't feel better about it. One, obviously, major concern. So two sevens and a five. Uh, Garrett, why don't you start? I that? mean, I think I saw enough from Lamar Jackson. I think that he can lead this offense effectively, that it's going to be a completely different offense that we, we've seen with Joe Flacco. But I think that I have really been impressed with what I've seen from Lamar this entire season. I liked what he did yesterday. He gives them something, obviously, in the running game. And I actually thought that he threw the ball better yesterday than I kind of expected. Now, he didn't throw the ball a lot. But when he did throw it, I thought it was pretty good. So I, I like what I've seen. All right, I mean, we don't even do knew the numbers because I want to spend time on this while we have it. Let's dive into if Joe's healthy, RG3's in the mix as well, and you have Lamar doing what he did, how do you view the balance here moving forward, the decision-making? Ryan, I'll let you start, and everybody gets a shot at it. I, I think I would go back to Joe if he's healthy at the end of the day, but it, it's a very difficult decision for me. Dennis? I have no personal connection to no. Joe or any, <laughs> no, any no bias lines. in this opinion at all, but – Listen, I think I saw you at Lamar's house last I, I, I said five in this particular question. I know we don't care about the numbers because we have not seen the other side of Lamar that we need to see, the passing element to his game. I gave him a five because five out of five for running. He was tremendous running the football. Now a zero out of five for throwing because I haven't seen it yet. So I can't have confidence in something that I don't know. But if I'm t picking right now, I have to go back to Joe Flacco because I understand – this is a passing league at the end of the day. You can get away winning games like that on occasion. When you're playing subpar offenses, in my opinion, an A.J. Greenless Bengals is a subpar offense. 
the 32nd ranked defense, you can run all over a defense like that. You can win games like this. I just think it's not a sustainable model through the whole season because you talk about games, teams like the Chiefs, you have to put up a lot of points. You have to be able to throw the ball. You might be in a situation where you get down. I just haven't seen it from Lamar. That's why I don't have confidence in it. And Joe, in my opinion, gives you the best chance to do those kind of things moving forward. And because what's at stake cannot be ignored. Yeah. But coming up next, love it or hate it. Welcome back to Ravens Unscripted, final segment of the show. Love it or hate it? Pretty simple. I'll present some Ravens-related topics, and the guys will tell me if they love it or hate it. First up, and there's a theme here. Some coaches, uh, uh, funny and not so funny. Um, first up, though, John Harbaugh's pregame dance. Uh, our crack camera crew caught him. Uh, I don't even know what you call it uh, with some of the defensive linemen. Uh, guys, love it or hate it, Ryan, you first. Well, I'm a dad, and it was like dad dancing. So it was. It's, it's like terrible, so I love it. <laughs> you love it. You would love it. Um, <laughs> oh, you don't have any dance moves. You have no dance moves. Mate, you don't know what kind of rhythm I have. <laughs> so don't comment on my dance moves. I'll comment on Coach Harbaugh's dance moves, though, because we got to see it. And I've seen it before. I watched him try and dab one time in a team meeting, and it made everybody uncomfortable. <laughs> And so I will give him credit. He stayed kind of in his lane. He didn't get too yeah. wild. He, he stayed, you know, kind of tight. But uh, it was it was uncomfortable, to say yeah. the least. I thought, I thought it was funny. Like, before the game, you know, you know, you wonder what kind of mood the team's in. Are they tight? Are they loose? And you got your coach down there doing this thing. I think it kind of kept everybody loose. I liked it. And on the back end of this, we'll see where it really led itself. But the whole week, uh, Harb seemed to be in a uh, pretty good mood. All right, here's Marvin Lewis, though. His thoughts after the game. Quarterbacks don't run forever in the NFL. Sooner or later, they get hurt. They don't run the same. But today, he could run, and he did a good job. Obviously, he's describing Lamar Jackson's day. Uh, love or hate Garrett sort of would sound a bit like sour grapes. Well, I mean I, – But maybe I, accurate. I think he's accurate. I mean, when you look, Lamar Jackson's not going to carry the ball 27 times a game, so I guess I love it from the standpoint of I agree with Marvin Lewis. So over the course of his career, you're not going to draw up many game plans and say we're going to have you carry the ball 27 times. You know, I think he's good at avoiding hits, but, you know – Players know it only takes one big hit to kind of change and alter a guy's career. RG3 is obviously a perfect example of that. So, obviously, you're not wishing any of that, but I do think that it is certainly in the back of everyone's mind when you see him carrying the ball that much. And I hate it. I, I think it just sounded a little bit petty, especially right after a game like that where you got beat on the road. Um, but like you mentioned, it, it isn't inaccurate because you cannot sustain through a whole season taking hits like that, having that many carries as a quarterback. is just going to catch up with you eventually. And so... Um, I, I hated how he said it, but, but he isn't wrong. All right. I promised it. It's the post-game speech that's <laughs> probably uh, <laughs> sweeping the nation as we speak. Here's a, a sample of it from John Harbaugh. Two men taking a third down conversion. Got the ball in scoring range. Good! <laughs> we got him backed up to the nine-yard line to win the game. The tight end runs a little shake round. Throw comes down with a spectacular catch. Good. What else? Give me something else. The coach said it all there. It was all very good. So I just want uh, one-word answers here. Love it or hate it? The post-game speech. I love it. Gate. I love it. I love it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I love it too. It was pretty weird, but it was great. It was fun. That'll do it for this episode of Ravens Unscripted. There are still tickets available for the Raiders home game, so make sure to go grab those, and there'll be a special performance at halftime by country duo Low Cash. Enjoy the game, everybody, and we'll see you right back here next week on Unscripted.